What's going on, everybody? Hope you are having a wonderful week so far. Podcast time. I'm really excited about this one. Gregory Godet, um, very good friend of mine. He was actually the first person on the podcast ever. Um, and this is the second one. Um, if you don't know who Gregory is, sliding, sliding away from music, Gregory is an extremely well-accomplished chef. Um, he has been on Top Chef couple times he has released a cooking book he has done so many things in the cooking world as a chef and he has recently just opened his new restaurant called Khan and is about to open a bar on top of that this guy is busy as hell so I feel very privileged that I've been able to sit down with him for just over an hour without further ado Gregory got it how are you, brother? I miss you. I miss you too, man. I bet, like, so I text you just a minute ago. It was, well, a couple of hours ago, I was like, can we, like, I'm around if you want to do it earlier. And you're like, this is my first day off in three weeks. <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> and I was like, dude, I feel you. I am so fucking tired right now. <laughs> and Wait, I... Have you been on the road? Oh, uh, dude. Yeah, let me just turn you up one second. Yeah. Yeah, man, just been nonstop for the last like. Um, Are you in the states? No, I'm in the UK. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So mm. I got back yesterday. Well, I got back on oh, yeah. Friday and then left again and got back again um, last night. So, how are you, man? Uh, I'm doing all right. Everything's okay. Hanging in there. The restaurant is going in to be six weeks old. We just got a nice little write up in the New York Times. No way. 50 best, 50 best restaurants in the country right now. So that's Sick. nice. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. But it's been good. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's been a lot of work, mm. but there's a very good reception to it all. Amazing. And it feels, it feels good to be open and running after years of planning and yeah. construction and challenges with the city mm. on getting all our permits and the space built and all that good stuff. So, so let's do a little bit of an update for everyone. Um, if anybody is new onto this podcast, Gregory was the first guest we ever on the podcast, <laughs> which is kind of crazy because that was like two and a half years ago. Yeah, you're gonna be like the hundred and thirtieth guest, cranking them out. Yeah, just nonstop. Um, so thank you for being the first guest. Oh, and uh, I get to sit amongst the roster of all these legendary DJs. <laughs> <laughs> you are on the Will Clark podcast. You're a legendary chef, let's be honest. <laughs> you're a legendary chef. <laughs> Far from legendary. I see your croissants. <laughs> <laughs> I need to I need to make you some. <laughs> but to be fair saying that you also need to cook for me because you've never cooked for me i i know when are you coming to portland i know man i'm trying to book okay. it in okay but i yeah, come and then play in our bar and then i'll make you dinner seems like a fair trade-off <laughs> if you ask me yeah i definitely <laughs> like dinner that's like uh it's a big miss in our relationship. I, know. I don't <laughs> I actually. I don't actually think you can cook. I think you're a fake chef. <laughs> <laughs> it's all facade. It, it is. It's all fake. Um, Just smoke and mirrors. But yeah, so a lot has happened in the last two and a half years. Um, obviously, COVID happened. Um, you left your job right before COVID, I believe, or or maybe like six mm -hmm. months before. Yeah, right uh, before. Yeah. yeah. Um, before, you yeah. opened a Khan to pop up in during the COVID, which was extremely successful and sold out pretty much every single table throughout the whole kind of period. You wrote a cookbook. You won a James Beard Award for your cookbook. Mm -hmm. You've opened a restaurant and you're about to open a bar. Yes. A little busy. <laughs> Jesus Christ, son, <laughs> chill out. <laughs> so I think we caught up in April in 2020. 
Um, yeah, just like one month into the pandemic. Yeah. Um, you had an amazing birthday party at the end of the pandemic as well. Yeah, which, you flew in just for that. I flew in for that, which is very which is, honored and impressed and still very grateful for that. That, nah, was man, little... that was fun. That was a fun party. I had a good time. But I kind of want to just catch up with you on everything. And I want to... So, like, the podcast has evolved more and more into, like, getting to know people and how careers started. And I think we kind of did a bit of that um, on the first podcast. But I really want to go into, like, some more depth of what your life is like and how deep you have to go into to kind of run everything on on what you're doing. You, You do a lot. And juggling that is a lot um and and i think people are, would be really interested in in that side of it so i kind of want to like start from the book because you were talking about writing the book then mm-hmm. and you i don't think i think you'd started um but I don't yeah I, like so uh the end the sorry the pandemic was really when i was like finishing all the recipe testing so I was actually working out of a friend's kitchen, which is larger than my apartment. And when, yeah, when we went into lockdown, I just had to finish recipe testing at my house. Mm. Uh, but yeah, so when we spoke, you know, I think I turned everything in in November of that year. Yeah. So we had a few more months of recipe testing and, and planning, and then we went to editing. Mm. Uh, and then the book came out uh, in 21. So, but, you know, I mean, I think, I I mean, I think just generally, uh, I feel like there's so many things you can do as a chef, Mm. you know, I mean, I just like with a lot of our professions and the paths that we choose, there's so many things you can do. Like even as a DJ, you can perform, you can write, you can produce, you, you know, um, there's so many avenues that we can take with our art and our profession. So writing a book seemed like something natural, Mm. uh, it wasn't an idea I had for a long time, but I just was inspired by a couple of colleagues to, to write the book. Yeah. And for me, the book was, I really wanted to write a book that helped people eat better. Mm-hmm. So the book is, uh, it's super allergen friendly. Uh, it's a health book. It's, it's a health book disguised as a, as a regular cookbook, honestly. Okay. Um, and, it, and it taps into global cuisines from all across the world, mm-hmm. uh, including my Haitian heritage and, you know, uh, I worked in Pan Asian concepts for quite some time. So, driving inspiration from those influences. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've worked in French kitchens, I've worked in Spanish kitchens, uh, you know, tapping into the broader Pan Caribbean uh, diaspora as well, which is, you know, inspired by where I'm from in Haiti, yeah. uh, where my family's yeah. from. So, so, yeah, so the book draws on all different cultures from all around the world and it's written for home cooks Mm. so if you're an adventurous home cook it's like the perfect book for you if you're just trying to eat a little bit better it's an amazing book i'll be honest i still haven't cooked anything from it because i suck because i suck as a friend (laughs) but i've got a copy and i've read it like i've gone through it multiple times and i've caught my housemates going through it um lots it's like a really interesting read it's not just like a recipe book um which I find really interesting with the process. Like how many recipes do you have to make to get into the, into it? Well, the, the book actually grew. Uh, it, it, it's, it's 200 recipes, mm. but I think when you're a chef and you are used to cooking in a, in a restaurant and you have like a team and you have all these resources at your fingertips, yeah. it's a lot easier to you know make super complicated food or you know you just go a little bit above because people are coming for a dining experience and you know they you they're expecting something elevated or complex so for a home cook you know you don't want to be you know cooking a million different things just to create one dish so you know in my head i create a dish i have a sauce i have a protein i have a vegetable maybe there's a pickle yeah but uh so the book grew because we simplified, we tried to simplify all those recipes. Yeah, yeah. So it actually ended up being 200 recipes and it's broken up into 14 chapters, you know, and there's seafood, there's meat, there's birds, there's eggs anytime, there's soups, there's three vegetable chapters, 
uh, there's pickles, there's sauces, there's desserts. So it's like really broken up into different categories that are easy to flip through and figure out. Because I like, it's, will you tell me if I'm wrong, but I feel like there's a lot of cookbooks that actually aren't written by the chef. Uh, so, I mean, <laughs> or is that like a controversial thing that no, we shouldn't I mean, talk about? I think, no, I mean, I think, I think there are, if you're like a really, really famous celebrity chef, like yeah. you have a team that's working on your book, mm. like 100% for sure. Yeah. You know, but I am just a normal person. So it's, it was a very, very personal project. Mm. So for me, you know, I, I worked on all the recipes myself, you know, I mean, we had a pretty big team because it's a pretty big book, but, yeah. um, I mean, like, you know, I would say someone like Chrissy Teigen probably has a team that's helping mm. her like write her book, but like someone like me, you know, um, it was a very personal project. Well, it um, makes sense. That's why there's so much. It makes sense because it's the same in music. When the big, the bigger you get, the less likely you're going to be writing your own music purely because it's just a time thing, if I'm honest. And uh, I think the, like, let's be honest, David Guetta doesn't write his records, in, but he's has to be in every, like three places at one time. So it's, mm -hmm. I, I kind of understand that. I want to talk on like a therapeutic level, like during the COVID, how was it, was it, stressful writing the book or was it something that like really helped you just kind of escape from the, the mundane life of covid yeah i mean at the, at the top of 2020 you know i had quit my job in 2019 mm. and i was about to go travel i had you know i was planning on taking the year off to, yeah. to travel and start working on the restaurant and i was gonna go to haiti i was gonna go down south and you know like study american barbecue yeah i wanted to go up to the northeast and like study american seafood because like all those things are represented in what we do at the restaurant mm. but you know i was just locked down at home with everyone else but i mean i feel like that was the opportunity where i was able to really dive into the books yeah. um especially as someone who cooks in a restaurant like chefs don't really cook at home a lot mm. um unless you probably have a family um but like you know like a bachelor like me you know like i never really cooked at home but like the pandemic you know, made us all cook at home so yeah I was actually like meal prepping and, you know, it helped me fine tune these recipes because I was actually cooking at home for the first time really yeah. in like many, many years since I started working. Is it a thing being a chef that by the time you get home, you don't really want to cook for yourself? Uh, I mean, it depends, you know, like I get home at like one in the morning, you yeah. know, so I, I, you know, I really definitely don't want to cook. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, if I have a lot of free time, I like it's easy to meal prep. Yeah, I guess this is, I don't know about you, but like when, when you have time off, um, like, do you like to be cooking? And like, if you got friends over or like when you're socializing, do you like to be the cook or do you actually like to like step back and not do it because it's, it's, jo it's your job at the end of the day. And like, <laughs> like, let's be honest, you're a great chef, but, it's similar to me to a certain extent. It's like, do I really want to be working? Like, do, do I want to go to a club on my night off? 100% not. Like you would not, <laughs> unless a friend is playing, you would not catch yeah. me in a club like on a um, night off. Yeah. I mean, that seems very interesting, but you know, I mean, I enjoy cooking. It, it comes very naturally. Yeah. You know, uh, but you know, if someone else wants to cook, that's really great. But it's like, it's like very naturally, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, but like, if you were like, you know, behind the decks and you're hanging out, like, you know, you drop a couple tracks, you know what I mean? Like, totally. I think, <laughs> I, but I think like, honestly, I, like brutally honest, if I had a night off, uh, I would not really want to go to a club. Yeah. Only because I think the thing is I have this weird relationship with venues is that like I love DJing and I love performing, but my first ever experience in a club was me DJing. It wasn't mm -hmm. me going to raves and partying. So I kind of never really had that like rave mm -hmm. rave thing. Whereas yeah. if someone cooks for you, do you judge them? <laughs> <laughs> No, not at all. I just appreciate it. What? I mean, if, if they want feedback, I'm happy to give them feedback. But I mean, for me, I I don't judge them. But I mean, if something needs a little seasoning or needs a little salt, <laughs> like I get it. But, 
I put I put quite a few things in my mouth, you know, like I'm I'm good, you know, like I wouldn't I shout just, about that just, too just, much, mate. Just, I wouldn't just, shout about that too much. Just, just, <laughs> <laughs> just the act of someone cooking for you is a gift. So if anyone cooks for you, you should just appreciate it. So when someone cooks for me, you know, especially, you know, someone who's not a professional cook, of course I appreciate it, you know? Yeah. But if it's bad, you're going to tell them, I hope. <laughs> I would I no, I wouldn't break their heart. If they wanted feedback, I'd be happy to give them feedback. I don't know, because if I cook for you or when I cook for you, I want yeah. I want you to like be brutally yeah. honest. Yeah, yeah. But you know, you have that relationship with certain people, you yeah. know. And like when I cook for you, I want you to be brutally honest too. I mean, I'm as a chef, I'm always looking for feedback. Whenever people come in to eat, you know, like I want critical feedback. Yeah. You know, and I think sometimes people are scared to give feedback. Or sometimes people don't really want to hear feedback, but actually do want to hear feedback, you know? Because yeah. I, I always think there's different perspectives on on what people see in a dish or how it tastes to them. And, you know, if I'm if I make something that doesn't mean that it's perfect every time or that it means that someone connects to it. Yeah. Sometimes it does, but it's it's just interesting and cool to hear what people's perspective is on food. And uh you know, is it too spicy? Is it mm. seasoned? Um, you know, there's all these nuances that people pick out, which I think it's very interesting to know. Yeah, I guess it's really interesting. It's it's because I, I think food is such a personal thing, right? So like what's something might taste so different to you than it, what it does to me. So it kind of, is it really hard to kind of take feedback? Not hard to take feedback, but like hard to like, how do you like process that in a way where you can take the feedback and then make the dish better? Or do you, do you necessarily yeah. listen to the feedback? Obviously, obviously you listen to the feedback, Yeah, but like, I, mean, I think a, we live in a world where reviews are a huge part of what we do. Mm -hmm. So even if we want feedback or not, like we're going to see reviews. I get there. Yeah. I get reviews in my inbox every morning really? from like the night prior. Really? So, I'm constantly getting people's feedback and, you know, there are multiple other platforms, be it, you know, Resi, which you'll use, you know, Yelp, like Google, yeah. you know, people are leaving reviews every single day. So I read that, but, you know, reading that, you know, I don't have an ego around my food whatsoever. I you know, that. I think it's very important if, if multiple people are saying, or it's it, all the food is spicy, mm. then I would probably take a look and, you know, maybe try to reduce the spice in one or two dishes, yeah. you know, that's not really the case. We we've had like a couple people say it's like way too spicy. So I'm not changing anything. Um, they just, weak. but you know, <laughs> but also like, you know, if something becomes a favorite, you know, yeah. ever, everyone's talking about a specific dish, you want to keep that dish on the menu Entirely. You know, because obviously it's a fan favorite and people want to come back to that. So maybe that's something you consider keeping on the menu. So for me, I just think it's just a way to get better, yeah. you know, and to improve because at the end of the day, you know, I can create something. I can consider myself an artist and I can make food with my team, but mm. really it, it's, it's, it's really about the consumer and the guests who are going to be spending their money um, on that item. Mm. And if they don't want it, they don't want it. You know, it's really interesting you say that because I, I have that same feeling with music um and that although i create a record the minute it's out it's not mine it's it's the it's the universe's and it's down for people to enjoy it or not enjoy it and if they do enjoy it then it will kind of convert into people coming to my shows or streams or buys or whatever or it won't how at what point in your career did you get to that point where you were like, where the, I guess the ego goes and it's purely positive each time you read a review or read, listen to feedback or something like that. Cause I don't think that's, I don't think that's a, a thing. Sh I don't know. It could have been for you, but I don't think straight away for me, I think it, I always kind of struggled with feedback to a certain extent, but, it took me a, a while to kind of get there. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think feedback is just a part of life. I think it's just like, again, like when we talk about the ego, um, you know, I think it's just like just being open to other perspectives yeah. and perceptions of you. You know, I think especially when you're in a position of leadership, 
Mm-hmm. It's like extremely important for you to be able to listen to what other people think of you, especially yeah. if you're telling people what to do all the time, um, or, or people are, are relying on you for mm-hmm. information or, you know, for part of their career, you know, so, you know, you have to listen to what other people are saying yeah. to, to, to truly lead, you know, because you can't lead just what you want. You have to lead what the collective conscious is. Mm. So um, I think for me, um, you know, I mean, I think there's a couple of things, you know, I think a being like on a show like top chef or like on these competition shows where you're, you're constantly yeah. being judged, you know, and you, and, and it's, you know, it's nothing personal. It's just, it's about the dish. It's about the food. So, um, and then, you know, those reviews are real, you yeah. know, so I mean, if you're constantly trying to get better and be better and have a broader mass appeal, um, which is something that I strive for because, you know, I have a big restaurant, Mm. you know, I need to keep all those seats filled. You know, we have lots of different types of guests. So it has to be the food and the experience has to be something that pleases lots of different types of people. Yeah. um, So we can stay busy and stay profitable. Makes total sense. If you're, uh, chef coming up underneath you in your restaurant or something like that how does it work with people making dishes or kind of coming up with ideas and kind of developing dishes for the restaurant and and for you as a as a chef um so the the menu development process is oftentimes it just starts with me and the ideas that I want on the menu. Uh, usually it starts with a vegetable or a protein. It's like, hey, I want to do red cabbage mm-hmm. or I definitely want to do chicken um, or I definitely do want to do a beef rib. Let's do a whole fish. Uh, watermelon's in season for a few months. Let's, let's crush watermelon. Yeah, And then it's kind of thinking about what goes with those ingredients uh, in a different way, there also needs there always needs to be a cultural perspective, um, and then usually what happens at that point is after there's like a kind of a blueprint of what these dishes are, we go into recipe testing, and that's when it's dispersed with the teammates um, and my chef team, and they start working on the different parts. Mm. You know, like uh, we have this one dish, which is a, a butterfish dish, which is. Uh, Walu, it's a Hawaiian fish. It's really fatty. Yeah. Um, we just sear it on the outside and serve it with grilled smoked pickled cucumbers nice. and then uh, a spicy watermelon juice. And then we, we freeze half of the watermelon juice um, and shave it on top. Um, but that's just something that was like in my head. And that dish was a lot of different things before it became that. But my chef, Aranya, she's the one that recipe tested the entire thing, mm. you know, so I just wrote down a few notes on, on what we, we we should do. Yeah, she worked on it. It didn't work out, and then she came back, and uh, she's the one that actually developed like the exact recipes for those. So that that happens throughout the team quite a bit. And how long does that take, roughly? Like, obviously, from from concept with you in your head to a piece of paper to then actually going on the menu. Like, how many times does that have to be made and tested before it actually goes out, or is it literally a same day thing where you're like, fucking this? crack on yeah i mean some things take quite a bit of time honestly because there are so many variables between like making something once you know and then having to make something like 40 times a night (laughs) and what that system looks like yeah so you know you can make something once and it's very easy but when you scale something and you, you do the recipe times 20 you don't you don't necessarily have to scale all the ingredients it's like this weird thing where like something some things are off you yeah. know, can you mix it the same way? Like, are you, is it going to take too long to process it with like a certain tool? Do you need to use a different tool? Because instead of like one pound, you know, I'm making 10 pounds. Yeah. Um, does that change the texture? So there's like all these variables of making something once and then making something like 40 times a night, which we have to at the restaurant. Mm. So that can take quite a few weeks. You know, that butterfish dish itself, it was like one of the last dishes that we figured out, but like people love it. It's a signature dish right now. Mm. Um, but that definitely took, I would say about three weeks Mm. before we got it right. Um, Is that three weeks of having it on the menu and still tweaking it or three weeks of like um, until it's on the menu? No, three weeks of just like making it like every couple days and going back to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And then there's other dishes like we have a brine chicken dish that took quite some time because 
you know, we're brining chickens yeah. and it, there's a salt ratio involved. We brine them and then we dry them and we grill them. So it's like this multi-day, multi-step mm. process. It takes three days to make each chicken. Wow. So within that, you know, if, if one day it's too salty um, or the next day it's not seasoned enough, yeah. um, one day it's sticking to the grill, there's all these variables that you play with, but it still takes three days to make each chicken. Mm. So um, it's just about that process of being able to start over and just keep going and then finally getting to the final product, which we have now and it's money. Yeah. Um, but again, that, that took quite a few weeks to, to figure out. And are you writing all of these down or is it something that's like in the head? No, we write everything down. Yeah. So we, we measure everything by the gram. We nice. measure salt. We measure cooking time. Yeah. Um, we have everything like by the gram, weighed out, scaled. Um, so everything is, is exact. Um, everything is consistent. Yeah. Um, especially if we're making something 40 times, you want every single person who has it to experience the same thing. Totally. Um, then you also want the system to be as clear as possible because if different people are making it, you want them all to, to just have like the blueprint and the recipe yeah. to be able to follow it and, and, and make it perfectly every time. Yeah. Would you ever re like release those recipes into a book? <laughs> uh, like the restaurant? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, my, I'm actually quietly working on my next book. We're like kind of like throwing <laughs> ideas around. Yeah. But <laughs> can I stay busy? Mm -hmm. But again, I think it's going to be another book designed geared to home cooks, but I, I definitely know, I know it will feature a lot of the recipes from the restaurant Yeah. Um, in a, in a home cook friendly way. Mm. Um, because the flavors are just so good. And uh, you know, I mean, there's like, you know, people like you who are like, really really good non-professional cooks that are excited by different cultures yeah. and different ingredients and um and the book is really geared towards those folks um i think i'll try to scale it back even just a little bit and have a broader range um yeah. of easier recipes because I, I i do believe we're so busy mm. especially in like the normal world where you're you know you're you have a partner or you're married or you have kids, people kind of want to get dinner on the table a lot totally, faster. Totally. So that's the book, so book number two. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. I think there's a, there's a, I have this, um, this recipe book from a restaurant called Dishoom, which is like a famous Indian restaurant in the UK. Mm -hmm. Um, they have like, I think they have like three locations in London. Yeah. I've been there. Yeah. It's pretty good. Um, but that, their, their book is like, it's not massive. Like there's not loads of recipes but it's all based on what they sell in the restaurant. And, but it's also a lot of, a lot of it is like a story behind each, each dish. So I guess that kind of fills the book up into something a little bit more special where you're getting, I think you're getting a trimmed down version of the menu. And of course it's like, you're not adding as much as seasoning as they would in the restaurant. It definitely doesn't taste like what it does in the restaurant, but it's still, a very close like replica of of what you're getting in the restaurant which i really like because it, it kind of shows you the process of how they do it in the restaurant which is really interesting it's a really good book to be fair mm -hmm. really good book um i want to go to opening your first restaurant um from concept to now where you've been open couple of months i believe um yeah six weeks six weeks it's crazy how let's go back to concept you we spoke about this a couple years ago on the podcast where you were wanted to start your own restaurant eventually after doing a bunch of research and traveling and, and, and doing mm -hmm. all of that obviously you couldn't do any of that uh, or you couldn't do any of the traveling when What's the process of opening a restaurant? I oh, mean, it was it was a lot. It was, yeah. a lot, it was a lot of a lot, you know. Uh, so four years ago, I started looking. I you know was working with like a restaurant group, and I had talked to them. Things were going really well with all of us, and I had talked to them about maybe partnering with them. Um, so that was in discussion. I was looking at all these these different areas, you know, and I was actually looking at downtown. Uh, but downtown Portland has been ravaged by the pandemic. Yeah. So that was, you know, something that was a bill I dodged for sure. 
but you know, we didn't find our restaurant space till last summer. Mm. So, you know, I knew that it was going to be a big push, but we definitely wanted to open this year. We were trying to open in the spring. So first it was a huge push to a raise the money, um, which was like the biggest part because you can't do anything without money. And how do you, how do you, how do you do that? Like, I kind of want to go a bit, into, bit more into process so it's rather than like surface level. Like, how do you mm-hmm. raise the money for a, a restaurant? Like I don't have a clue and I'm sure most yeah. people don't have a clue. Um, well, so the, the first thing that we did was we had our pop-up in like winter 20 to 21. Yeah. So we, that was about, that was four months of a pop-up and we, all that money we saved, um, all the revenue from that we saved and we invested that into all the kind of earlier starting things that we needed to get done for to start the restaurant like hire the lawyers you know um sign the lease Mm -hmm. pay first months and last month's rent that start start paying some of the construction costs yeah um the designer fees so that's where that all started you know luckily um i've been in the community for quite some time i have some really good friends i've been talking about opening my own place for some time so a lot of I had a good amount of people who had offered to invest yeah. without me even asking. Mm-hmm. So that was like a huge piece of it. And that was extremely helpful. Um, and then a couple of things happened. So we, we raised a bunch of money really soon. Um, and then a few things happened. I had one investor back out last minute who's going to invest quite a bit and costs just literally skyrocketed yeah. you know the reality of the amount of money that we needed to raise um almost doubled mm-hmm. over the course of the next few months so that is what sent me into a little bit of a scramble um in terms of being able to find money um so yeah so there was quite a bit of money to have to figure out um and it's really about thinking about who's in your network what type of investors you want you know I want to be in full control. Yeah. Um, I want this to not be like, I wanted to keep it in the family, you know, mm-hmm. at some point. So the people that I reached out to were people who believed in the project, totally. you know, and I think that's the biggest piece, you know, because this is like a very, very personal project. Restaurants are extremely challenging. A lot of restaurants don't make any money whatsoever. Yeah. It's a huge risk. So you really need people who believe in you, mm-hmm. you know, and I was able to find people who believe in me um, and they know that they know that I'm going to work my ass off to yeah. try to make this restaurant as successful as possible, you know, because on paper, it might not look great to invest in a restaurant at the end of the pandemic in Portland, Oregon, yeah. you know, um, that's probably does not sound like a sound business adventure. Um, but, you know, but if you know me, if you like really know me, yeah. you know, I'm going to work my ass off to make anything, what anything I touch successful. And those are the people that I was able to find, you know, I mean, I hit up friends, um, you know, people have been burned by the pandemic and they're like, Hey, Nope, I'm never investing in a restaurant ever again, you know, and they're, <laughs> yeah, they're yeah. very honest with me or, you know, I'm selling my house or I just, I just can't do anything with the money right now. The yeah. stock market is weird. We're going into a recession. Yeah. Like, really really close friends that i hit up um told me all these things yeah. and i just i just went to the next person um and then we we finally got funded you know at the end of the day you know it, it truly was like the black community that came through for me Nothing. um and like you know our last investors are all investors of color because they believe in the mission behind the restaurant I love and that. you know that's you have to find people who believe in you more than they believe in the project 100 percent, 100 percent. because realistically is your drive it you're driving the project right yeah it's nobody else it's you and it's all down to you how much pressure is that though because like that's a lot of pressure i I think once you're over the hump of them saying we believe in you you know then that's it because you know i had people say they believe in me but they can't sign they can't sign this agreement you know so it's like you don't actually believe in me if you're not willing to invest in me, you know, like if you say you believe in me, then you invest, you know, so don't tell me you believe in me, but you don't really want to invest in the restaurant. So it's about finding the people that are just, Hey, I'm here for you, whatever you need. Um, I'm going to help you till the, to the bitter end, you know? And, um, you know, I'm, I'm just happy that we have a beautiful, busy restaurant for our investors to come to. Um, and, you know, they've just all been extremely great and extremely supportive. And, you know, 
they're very close friends at this point and um that's a relationship that i wanted you know yeah totally that makes sense totally so we so we we get the money the construction hasn't started yet what's the next step uh construction started right away so that was probably the biggest piece so the group that we work with the landlord he has a full-time construction team he's done multiple restaurants in the city so that was like the first piece like mm-hmm. you just have to get construction going or yeah. else you'll never open on time mm-hmm. and especially during the pandemic you know when there's like you know supply chain crisis yeah. you know um supply chain crisis there's a lack of workers yeah you know people are out with covid you know there's a million construction jobs that are not getting done so we felt extremely lucky that we were able to have the team that we did um because they were able to just keep going Mm -hmm. um you know we had construction team going six seven days a week you know 12 hours a day um we were extremely resourceful you know with like the supply chain demands that we had uh, we were able to just be very upfront with people and be like, Hey, can you do this in this amount of time? Yeah. You know, and is the answer? Yes. Can you provide these products, these supplies, these materials in this amount of time, you know, and people are could, and some people couldn't, and we work with them and some people couldn't, and, you know, and we didn't work with them, but mm. it, it was, we had to be extremely aggressive. You know, I mean, the other piece of it is, you know, permitting around this country is extremely challenging, yeah. especially when a lot of government workers were like working from home. So um, permitting in, in Portland is extremely challenging. So, you know, I had to like dive in and, you know, call my congressman, you know, befriend my commissioner just so I can get their offices helping us, you know, with construction permits and all that good stuff. So, you know, once construction is going, it's, it's a million decisions, you know, yeah. it's like picking the floor, picking the, the stone picking you know do you want this curve or do you want this square mm. um all of the design pieces is this literally like I mean, an everyday was, thing because i i remember coming every, to i remember coming to the shop day. um and there, yeah i remember coming to the shop the shop the the restaurant before well yeah. you you you'd done a lot but there was still lots to go and it felt like a huge project you were kind of taking on which obviously is a huge project but like is it something that where you have to be in every single day like watching everything working on everything etc cetera, etc cetera? um i mean luckily you know i had you know tia who's you yeah. know my my biz partner and project manager and best friend she knows me really 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 well yeah so she was on the ground every day and i was able to kind of like do meetings and yeah. kind of like do a couple trips that i still had to but no it's 100 a every single day because every single day there's a million decisions being made from the plumber deciding like where all the you know drains need to go to like the lighting which took weeks and weeks and weeks and just Mm -hmm. deciding like you know all the lighting there's lighting in the ceiling there's lighting under the counter there's lighting in the kitchen yeah there's can lights you know there's design lights you know so like all these decisions takes time tons of time and our space was completely empty there was literally nothing there Mm. you know um so we had to build everything from inside the walls to out to from inside the walls to the walls to everything on top of that i guess that's the a nice thing that it's just a blank canvas that you can literally work with anything with 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 a blank room and you don't have to worry about there's no like limitations however you've got to build everything yeah i mean the limitation was you know can we get these materials in time yeah and what happens when we need more tile and and there's no more of that tile yeah because that's the last of it or (laughs) you know we we've purchased all this the all the this this specific material you know we purchased all of it that's in the country what do we do now we need more you know those are the things that we had to to face and figure out crazy man so construction started permitting's done you get to a point where you have a finishing date to open God, the, the finishing date, <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was a moving target for sure. Yeah. I mean, honestly, we're supposed to open in March. Yeah. I mean, that was like the loftiest, loftiest goal. Yeah. You know, and that was even before we started construction. So, I mean, I think the last realistic day we had was 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 May. It was May and then it was June and then it, and then it was July and then it ended up being August. So I think, you know, three, four months behind is is not like uh unrealistic 
pushback. You I know, think it's good. It's um, pretty good. I, I know people that have been delayed for a year. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. So I mean, we built that place from the ground up in nine months. That's mad. And yeah. you kept it, kept the location a secret for so long. <laughs> we did. We did. What was the reasoning behind that? Uh, it's just, you know, you know, just like a lot of my life is extremely public. Yeah. And I feel sometimes that I'm not ready to share things with people. And yeah. that's just it. You know, it, it was a live construction site. Um, we didn't want people just coming by and like nosing around, yeah. you know, it was, it was very tense at times because we were pushing so hard um and it just felt better to just keep things closed and protected yeah um and it, it builds up some anticipation and excitement around it as well totally totally i mean sometimes some sometimes things are just not ready for the world to see you know like it's like kind of like when you produce a track you know like you don't release that track till you think it's ready for the world i agree man and i think there's i think in a world where we overshare everything and we're mm -hmm. like i i'm happy to be challenged on this but like i feel like we're expected to overshare and mm -hmm. and potentially we people want a lot more of us than what we can necessarily give sometimes um i think it's really important to be able to have something that nobody knows about and yeah i just think it's just this is i think there's it's, for me there's also a, a huge part of it like if i'm working on a project where people don't know about it it allows it gets me excited and it allows me time to actually get to a point where i'm really really happy with it until and then i can t announce it to the public or announce it to anyone there's certain projects i'm working on that like literally only like four or five people know i'm working on mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. i think it's just like really important because i think there's also a level of expectation that comes out and i, I want to talk to you about how you have dealt with that as well but the the level of expectation that people have and build of you as working on a project and as for instance opening your own restaurant for the first time doing a cookbook for the first time You've done all these like huge, huge things in your that a lot of people would dream of in their career as a chef, and you've done it all within two years. Um, how do you deal with the expectations of other people? Mm, I mean, first of all, I have a lot of anxiety yeah. <laughs> in, in life yeah. that I'm, I'm trying to manage. But I mean, I think for me. I, I'm an extremely passionate and driven person. And honestly, I put a lot of critique on myself and I put a lot of judgment on myself. Yeah. Um, not in a negative way, but just in a way that, you know, I just, I want, I have high expectations for myself yeah. and I want the best for my teams. And I believe, you know, that I have a high level of taste, you know, and I think all these things coming together, you know, like, you know, probably some, I'm definitely a workaholic, which isn't necessarily a positive attribute mm -hmm. or characteristic. Um, you know, I am in recovery, you know, I'm an addict. So like, I still have that kind of like pulsing energy about me yeah. um, that keeps me extremely driven. Um, I've been, I've been able to channel that into good. Mm -hmm. um, so I think all those things kind of set me up to just always want to dream big, think big and just work as hard as possible to achieve those goals. Yeah. You know, I think, I think the other piece of it is that I 100% realize that nothing in this world comes easy. Mm. And if you want great big things, you have to put in the work, mm. you know, and I've been able to put in the work. I've been able to, you know, surround myself with great teams and collectively we've been able to work on really big projects um, and just like really make magic happen. And for me, I thrive off that. I really do. As tired as I am sometimes, as anxious as I am sometimes, I really thrive off just like the sense of completion um, and, you know, seeing something really big scale come to life. Yeah, well said. I want to go back to the anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> how do you deal with the, the anxiety? Or how are you learning to deal with it? Yeah. I mean, for me, I don't have it like terrible. Like I know like some people like it really stops them in their tracks. But I, I don't, uh, I don't, I, I, 
I also don't think you can compare any of your feelings to somebody else's feelings because, For sure. because your feel like your worst day is the worst day you've ever had. Like it might yeah. not be as worse as somebody yeah. else's, but it's the worst yeah. day you've ever had. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. your anxiety is the worst you've ever had it. If you know what I mean, to a certain extent. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. how do you deal with it as Gregory? Mm, I'm actually about to start talking to someone about it um, and seeing if there's some medication I can take. But honestly, like the first time I noticed having anxiety was like being on Top Chef and it was going to judges table. So, you know, I took Top Chef very seriously. I did pretty good first time, second time did pretty good too. And, you know, it's like you cook, you cook, you go through your mini challenge your quick fire, you go through your, your big elimination challenge. And then, you know, it's like that dramatic moment where everyone lines up and you go to judges table. If yeah. you've ever seen the show and it's like, you've done the event, you've cooked the food. It's like hours later, you know, the judges are all sitting there. You walk into this dark room and you have to face the judges. Mm. And of course, it's, you know, there's a lot of things to set up for TV. So there's a lot of waiting around. And it's like, it's extremely dramatic just because that's just the nature of it. Of it. Like yeah. there's a lot of waiting and not knowing if you did well or if you're going to go home. Yeah. So I just remember being in those moments or, you know, having the clock start to cook and just having my heart pounding and my heart racing mm. and, you know, it's, it's definitely a rush, you know, it's a rush to be able to push through that and to, you know, do whatever you need to do. You know, in those scenarios, it was, you know, cook food and, you know, hopefully win the challenge. Um, now a days, you know, with like, honestly, you know, the, the reverse of this is having so much on my plate. Um, you know, I just always feel like there's so much to do Yeah. and, you know, I'm not scared of a lot of things in life. Like I'm, I'm really not, you know, so I'm trying to figure out like where this anxiety stems from. I think it's just having so much to do and kind of feeling like there's not enough time to do it. You know, I think, yeah. I think that's where it stems from, you know, I think it's just stems from taking so much on my plate sometimes. Yeah. Um, it just makes my heart race very, very fast. I can relate to that, but I don't, for me, I don't think it feels like anxiety to me. I don't know what it is. But it, for me, it just kind of sometimes just feels like just a lot more pressure. What, how, mm-hmm. how does it, how does anxiety feel to you? Um, it's, it's just like my heart racing. It's yeah. like my heart racing, like really, really fast. Um, for no, for no reason. Like sometimes as soon as I wake up, <laughs> like really? as soon as I open my eyes, as soon as I open my eyes in the morning and just like thinking about everything that needs to get done or thinking like, you know, something isn't done and someone needs it. Um, yeah. Has, a magazine, a magazine needs a recipe, you yeah. know, or, you know, something like that. Does exercise help you? Cause I know you got uh, back into it. It does, but it does, but I've been having anxiety at the gym lately, really? which is very, very odd, you know, kind of like in the middle of that workout, you know, when you're pushing or you're lifting heavy, um, I've been getting anxious sometimes. Usually I feel great after, but yeah. it's, it's very interesting that that has been like extra hard. You I know, mean, I also realize that I'm, I'm in like a very heavy patch of my life and career mm-hmm. where I have a lot on my plate right now and have a lot of eyes on me. And I have a really huge team that I'm responsible for that I have to look out for and, you know, always make sure everyone is happy and safe. So all this, I mean, I think about all this stuff all the time, you know, it's extremely consuming. So I, I, I realize that, you know, I'm, I'm at a very, very very busy patch of my life and you know i think these feelings can are not are not surprising not surprising to feel like this right now yeah i i don't disagree with you that they will i i hope they pass as well because i think this is like as an outsider like i totally get that this is like a time of your life that's crazy i couldn't even imagine the pressure that you're on in right now um yeah but also it's like it's a time to try and enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you literally <laughs> like, fuck off, Will. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, I think for me, 
I don't know. I think like completing the project is like the most fun for me. You know? Yeah, but what's completing so, like, a is restaurant? Is, open? Like, when does your when does your project ever complete? Because I, 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 don't know. I, I is mate, it, I'm is it December. Is it is it the first year? You know, I don't know. <laughs> but this is the thing, okay? This is, and I think this is like it needs to be spoke about in all of our industries because I I am exactly the same as you, right? Like. I'll release a record, it, it will do really well. And then somebody will like, oh, that's done really well. And I'm like, yeah, could have done better. Like, <laughs> or like, yeah, but hopefully the next one, the, ne the next one has to do better. I was literally talking, yeah. I had dinner yeah. with my parents this, this, this evening. And it was like, like, I need to be doing this next year. I need to be doing that in two years. But within three years, I need to be here. And it's like, yeah. fuck's sake, Will, like, you had your best year so far. Like, why can't you just like sit down and just accept it? But it, there's something in me that can't. I think, I mean, I think we can't not chalk it up to drive and passion. You know, it doesn't have to be like this negative thing that we're con continuously seeking more, you know, like, yeah. you know, I mean, I think if, if at the core, at the core, I know that I'm happy with my life. You know, like I'm extremely yeah, yeah, totally. grateful for everything that yeah. I have. Yeah. I look around every single day and like, I know I'm blessed. I'm privileged. Mm -hmm. You know, everything yeah. I work for, I get, you know, even when it's hard, like even when it's really, really, really fucking hard, like I'm still okay. Yeah. You know, so, you know, I don't think it's necessarily a negative to be passionate and driven and always wanting to seek, you know, the next thing, mm. you know? Because I think, you know, we're creatives, you know, and like totally. oftentimes that for me, the next thing is, is it's, it's art, you know, it's mm -hmm. art. It's like being with my team. It's, you know, what else can I do to share with the world? What else can I do to share with my team? You know, um, the next thing for me involves so many other people, yeah. you know? No, I really like that. But I also think with what you're going about, about your anxiety and things like that. So is that not the case of like where you're at? Like you're just in another level of working your fucking ass off until it gets to the point where you take on another project. Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, I'm already like working on book number two. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a three year project, you know? <laughs> and then it'll be restaurant number two. And then it'll be something else. Um, oh God, I'm not, no, I'm not opening any restaurants for a while. No. It's enough. <laughs> It's yeah. a lot. Yeah, I'm happy with Khan. I'm like super happy with Khan. I'm super happy with the bar. Nice. Um, it's gonna keep me quite busy for quite some time. I'm like very excited about both. Yeah. So no man. I'm... See, look, you calm me down, Will. You made me just like <laughs> chill. <laughs> Mate, you can call me any day. I'm happy. I, I'd love to talk to you every day. Um, so I want to go back to the process. I know we're jumping here, there, and everywhere, but I you you're about to open obviously there's a huge process in staff and i know i uh wanted to apply to be a dishwasher at the restaurant for a bit um but how do, how do you pick your staff because i think also in your i don't know if anybody has is or anybody that hasn't seen the restaurant or hasn't booked to go book and go or follow them on instagram but like your restaurant is like an open kitchen so people i don't know like this is just me being naive and not under not knowing the kind of process of employing lots of people but like also i feel like you want to employ people that are like very passionate about working there because they're going to be watched all night long uh, yeah, I mean, I do feel extremely lucky and grateful that I do have such a strong team, um, especially in the kitchen, uh, great people all around. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I've been able to work with people that I've been working with for many years. I've been, been able to reunite with people I've worked with in the past, and yeah. I've been able to meet some new folks that have joined the team and they're just complete rock stars. They're really passionate about what they do. They're excited about the cuisine. They're excited about the culture. They're excited about pushing and just wanting to be successful uh, and just, you know, just making good food and advancing their careers. And, uh, you know, I think I, I feel very lucky that I track that that type of person to be teammates, you know. Mm. Um, but, you know, team is everything, you know. I mean, I think 
I tell them all the time, you know, like I'm only one piece in this puzzle, you know, and mm -hmm. I'm only, you know, one piece of this, you know, this whole entire system. And yeah. I, I have so much to do and that I really rely on them to do what they do and what they do best, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I just want to give them the space to do that well and, and shine. Yeah, I, I, I get that totally. What is your actual role? in the team apart from, team? Big, so, apart from big boss man which we all know but like what how how do you manage the team how do you keep the team in good morality and all of that yeah, when, when I mean, shit's I think the fan? there's different there's different layers of this you know the just the whole group and the system and how it all works and uh you know pretty much you know there's different people in uh in leadership of different elements of things from the pastry chef who's in charge of pastry and she's helping us with things in the morning mm. um our sous chef who's doing a lot of the ordering and prep make sure we have a lot of products in house um we work closely together because she works at night as well mm. um there's my chef Veranya, who's really kind of like my right hand person um and, and she kind of just has a, a very huge kind of overseeing role in terms of production um and staffing um making sure we have enough teammates making sure we have all the product you know in my role it's like it's a very kind of global role in terms of a final say on food making sure everything tastes as it should um just kind of like final say on you know just staffing um making sure that you know we're talking to people who have concerns or you know trying to address issues um what i do is extremely public facing so you know i'm interacting with all of the guests um and just making sure you know their experience is great um i'm working with the service team to make sure that you know all the service issues um, and all the service opportunities are, are handled well and just making sure generally people are having a great time um, in the dining room. Yeah. Uh, and then just kind of like dealing with media and handling media and kind of like all those national requests and national eyes, um, final numbers, final sound budgets, um, really kind of like the last stop is me mm. in terms of making all the big decisions for the restaurant. Do you enjoy it? I do. I mean, I mean, I love my job. You know, it's very funny because there was just like one point where I it was like kind of like the beginning of opening, and I was like, you know, is this did I make the right decision? Because I was <laughs> chilling in the pandemic. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's just you know, like like I was touching on, but prior, you know, there's so many avenues that you can take as a chef and like i didn't have to open a restaurant at all you know yeah. i could easily do tv and write and uh, appearances around the country like i could do that as a full-time job yeah um and have my own schedule and you know travel all the time but you know i wanted to open up a restaurant to help leave a legacy and help set something up for my team mm. and uh and I don't, I don't regret it. I, I, I love it. You know, I'm, I'm very think, happy. The restaurant's beautiful and we're doing amazing things. I think there's also a certain amount of like giving back to the community with a restaurant. Like, I don't think people realize how important restaurants are in the community and how, yes, you could be, I wouldn't call it selfish, but let's just call it selfish and just look after yourself for the rest of your career and just worry about earning as much money as you possibly can and and living the life of, w of what you want but i think there's something about a restaurant that really gives back to the community of portland gives back to the community of the people that work for you it it employs people it gives people time to meet people it's time to socialize time to experience amazing food which i think we've all forgotten about or forgotten that we missed that during the pandemic Mm -hmm. And I think there's something really special about that is that it's, I don't know, I just really like the concept of it. And I, I don't think people realize how much hard work goes into it all and goes on behind the scenes for you to open the doors every night or however many days a week you're open and then people can go and enjoy and eat. 
um, yeah. the special. No one, the average guest does not understand, nor are they, nor would they, you know, be expected to understand exactly what it takes behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, you know, when we talk about prices and just the hours, um, you know, it's extremely expensive to run a restaurant. Um, it takes hours and hours. It's like a, it's hard to get out of a restaurant shift in under 12 hours. It's like really hard, especially yeah. as a chef, you know, um, it's like a 12 to 14 hour day yeah. just to get dinner on the table every single day. Um, and I don't think a lot of folks realize that unless you kind of ask around and, you know, look around a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's really hard work, you know, from, you know, just having to receive the raw ingredients first thing in the morning to, you know, managing, you know, the team that's making everything, making sure everyone's making everything properly, putting the products away, cooking service, um, yeah. and then going into dinner, you know, things take, it takes a lot. Are you there from the open? Uh, I get in around like 11 and I, I leave around 12 to one. Yeah. A long day. One, one thirty. Yeah. Yeah. Super long days. Um, yeah. so opening day, you get to the point where day one of opening, what's that feeling when, when you wake up and it's, it's day of opening? Um, I'm trying to remember this last opening day, opening day. So I've, we've, I've thrown a few big parties in my life and have done a few big things. And it's like that feeling when you wake up in the morning of like excitement and anticipation yeah. and you just know it's going to be a big day. Um, but you feel ready. Yeah. I think that's, that's what that kind of felt like, you know, maybe it's like, you know, big gig night, you know, you just wake up pumped and ready to go. Um, so yeah, I, don't, I don't know if, I don't know if it, for me, it feels Ever, or it, if it really feels like that to me now because it's for me it's like so regular but like it's like i've not i'm not working my whole life to one thing where i feel yeah, like for yeah. you is like opening the restaurant you're working you've worked the last two years or four years or even your whole career to this one point where you're like wow like this is this is day one of a whole new life, really. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, like one thing that like, um, one perspective I've had I have is that I work so hard to, for the things that I do, and again, we talked about that level of expectation yeah. that you know, and I just have this high level of expectation. So like, I feel like it's like weird, but like a lot of things don't surprise me yeah. because like, I'm like, well, I just worked for, you know, we just built this place off for nine months. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I just had to raise all this money. Like we had to do like all this stuff for like the past nine months. Yeah. So like all the work has been done, you know? So it, it, it isn't like this weird, Oh my God, I can't believe I'm here Yeah. because I do believe that I'm here because I've done the work to get here, mm -hmm. you know? So that's that's the other perspective that I have on all the stuff. That how does can... how does that feel though for you to say that? Like, because like as you're saying that for anybody listening, you're like you've got the biggest smile on your face. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I mean, I don't want to sound like ungrateful for the things that I have, but like I feel that like I work really, really, really hard for the things that I have. Why so would like, you feel ungrateful? Why would you sound ungrateful? Because you because you because you're not like you've clearly yeah, worked yeah. your ass off for yeah. God. Like so, like so so yeah. So like whenever like it's like the big day. I just feel there's so much groundwork up to that big day. So yeah. it's just like, you're just excited to get, to get going, you know? It's really interesting that because I would think like as an outsider, like it makes total sense what you just said, but I would be like, I, oh, for me, it would be like proper nervous, just, just in case. Cause you don't know what's going going to happen. But realistically you said it all, you put all the work in to get to that day one where it should be running smooth and, and it should be, if, if all the work you've done is cr done correctly, yeah, yeah. then it's, you're good. You're laughing. Yeah. You're just, you're just excited. You know, that's that, that drives me a lot. Actually. I think that's big day, big show day for me is when that's the feeling when mm -hmm. it's like more of an excitement is like, 
when I'm going to do something that I haven't done before, but I know that I can do it. I think that's the kind of the feeling that I get as well, where it's like, yeah, this is, it's like another day in the office really, but you've worked your whole life to get to that point or to do this show or to do that. Um, yeah, that's important. And on top of opening the restaurant, you decided to make a bar. Yes. Are we allowed to talk about that yet? So the bar actually was supposed to be a wine bar. It's, it's, it's a space under the restaurant mm. and the team that was supposed to go in there, it didn't work out with them. And the landlord just offered us the space or had us consider the space. And we just, we just did it. And it's a pan Caribbean concept. Uh, it's called Susol, which means basement in Haitian Creole. Um, so I didn't know yeah, that so, that's what it meant. That's amazing. Yeah. So if you come to Khan, it's, it's like windows, it's plants, it's white oak, you know, it's, there's a lot of gold trim. And then when you come to Susol, it's downstairs, you go, you literally go downstairs and it's just really, really dark, um, beautiful, uh, cavernous, it's actually a pretty big cavernous space. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, this crazy tree wallpaper that has a lot of depth, this huge fuchsia banquette that wraps around the entire space and uh just these really great cocktails and, and pan caribbean is, is where the, the the food inspiration is drawn from so there's doubles there's beef patties there's salt cod fritters so uh uh it's it's really fun it's it's it, it ties in with con in terms of the cuisine and the culture um but in terms of its function and its design it's completely different and it's really cool i can't and, wait to see uh, it. you know and there's a great little sound system down there. So we can, you know, have a few late nights if whenever we want. We definitely need to throw a party in there. Absolutely. Definitely. Absolutely. I'm actually going to text Ryan after this and be like, <laughs> okay, let's get on it because we do need to plan it. Maybe we do Still. like, maybe we do like, I don't know, a New Year's Day party. That'd be epic. <laughs> 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 yeah because like, i've got an early new year's eve show where are you new year's eve i can't say it yet okay yeah, yeah, um yeah, yeah. but actually thinking about it we could okay. i could bounce out early and then come in new year's eve after the show and All right, then, let's, and then talk, we, let's talk. And then we let's could talk. do a new station. <laughs> Ryan's, Ryan's probably going to hear this on the podcast. And be like, dude, you wanted some time off, and now you're planning more, <laughs> more shows. Sounds amazing. Uh, um, are you happy? Yeah, I'm very happy. Nice, man. That I'm makes very, me happy. I'm extremely tired. Yeah. I'm like very, very tired just trying to figure it out. But, you know, I feel like in life, I think Oprah said it once, you can't have everything all at the same time. So... Mm. You know, and I know that anything great takes a lot of work. So I'm just pushing through, just trying to sleep when I can, go to the gym when I can, uh, spend time with my friends when I can. Mm -hmm. Like we're spending time together now. And yeah, if the rest of it is work, um, I know that the job, the work that we're doing is extremely meaningful. Yeah. Love that. It's, um, are you happy? <laughs> I am really happy, if I'm honest. Like, I've been doing a lot of reflecting recently, and I am I am genuinely really happy. I've had an amazing year, and I'm really lucky with what I've got. Um, there's a lot of work in the, like, background that's happening, which I'm really excited about. Um, mm -hmm. And it's kind of, for me, is, like, the next step in my career. Um but yeah, I'm, I'm really happy. I'm fuck the same as you I'm absolutely dead. Mm. I think yeah. like yeah. in August I slept in my bed like five times. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It was, it's crazy. But Hey, like if I guess the way I look back is like nine year old will when I what first started being a DJ, would I ever expect what we're doing now? Would I expect to, have the friends I have in this industry in my life? Would I expect to have the family around me? Like all of those things, like, man, I'm fucking lucky. 
really mm-hmm. lucky. So, and and that, like, deep down, that only comes from me creating that. Nobody else has done that. I've had a lot of good people around me to help me, but that's it's down to me. And it's the same for you. Like, none of this, none of what you've achieved is due to anybody else. Yes, you've had a lot of people that, to help you, but it's still you waking up every day and being the driving force of, of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we got to push, but I have a big team around me and I appreciate them, but yeah, every day you got to push. You have to, man. You have to. And and I think it's part of people's nature. And I think that's just, you're just one of those people, right? And we, we're kind of in that realm of people that just want to just keep working and, mm-hmm. and we have an idea and w- want to make sure that that idea is executed to the best of our ability. And if it's not, then it's not done yet and it's it's not ready to go and it, it has to be um but hey you just yeah we have a great life we do um would you advise anybody to open a restaurant uh I mean, <laughs> it's a lot yeah it's a lot it's a lot you know but you know i mean i, th- I say yes i say yes mm. Because a, it's a, it's a place where you can express yourself yeah. in a lot of different ways. B, it's a place where you can create a system for other folks to just have work. Yeah. You know, just being able to employ others, and especially people who are passionate about the industry and they want to be great cooks, they want to mm-hmm. be great servers, um, they want to make great drinks. Um, and I think C, you know, restaurants are, are pillars of the community. So, mm-hmm. you know being able to to make your mark and be a hub where people can celebrate special occasions um you know celebrate meals celebrate the people in their life you know that's really the most important thing yeah i agree you must see a lot in a restaurant as like a as an owner you must see a lot of people having going through different life experiences like how does how is that being you're you're actually like being part of that i guess uh, I mean, I think it's very powerful. Yeah. You know, I think, I think one of the most powerful things that I've seen is actually people from different cultures just finding pieces yeah. uh, of certain dishes that make them think of their own culture. Mm. And I've seen everything from, you know, uh, obviously, you know, Mexican families to you know African families uh, like West Africa, uh, you know people from the Philippines, uh, people from China, you know people from South America. They're all finding something in the food that they relate to. Mm. Um, and it's pretty cool to see. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine um, the way you allow people to book the dates for the restaurant is a bit different to most restaurants. Can you explain what you do and why you do it? And also how can people book if they want to? Yeah. So the reservations for Khan open up the month prior. So on the 2nd of October, all November reservations are going to open. So like that's the first day of November to the last day of November. Um, and on the 2nd of every month, so October 2nd at noon Pacific time, all the reservations go live for November. So that's the process for every single month. Mm-hmm. And I will say that the best seats usually go within an hour. Wow. So if you're not online with your resi open, your card information locked and loaded, ready to go. Um, I will say that the seats go really, really fast. So um, you just need to plan ahead a month. And How is that? Because like not many restaurants do this and I, I could uh, be wrong. No, I could be wrong. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's actually quite a few restaurants that release reservations per month, you know, and uh, it's not a system where we're trying to make people, you know, fight to get in, but right. it's just a way for us to manage things as a new restaurant month by month, mm. you know, and just to be able to control what's happening within that month and um, make sure that, you know, everyone has a great table um, and just manage cancellations and additions. So, um, working four weeks at a time is just a way for us to ensure that we're getting our systems down. Mm. If you get like a big reviewer or big press or something like that, 
How does that work in the restaurant game? Do they let you know beforehand? Do they book a table? Like what or what's the um, deal with that? It, it depends on some cities, like some big cities, I would say like New York or LA. I think there, there are viewers that are kind of like more less under their like under the radar. Yeah. Basically they don't they come unannounced, you know. I think I think generally, uh, you know, those type of viewers, you know, don't want special treatment. They want to experience it just like any other guest yeah. because they want to feel like the chef is doing something special just for them that everyone else won't have. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I feel like there's also a lot of a lot of that has changed, you know, like the the food writer that is in a wig and a mustache or whatever, like making reservations under different names, a lot of a lot of those people have come forward and just become part of the community, yeah. you know? Um, and yeah, you, you feed them. And at the same time, you know, you treat them just like any other guest because again, you don't want them to feel like they're getting much, much special treatment, you yeah. know? Um, but yeah, a lot of, a lot of, especially with like how open just everything is in the world these days and um how big media is to so many different elements of things. And, you know, there's so many food events that people go to, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, um, a lot of the food reviewers are public these days. Yeah. Just because they work on so much, you know, mm, totally, man. From inter- interviewing you, you know, just tell being to share your story. So a lot of them are, are public. I think it's important as well. I think it's like, it's much, it feels much more real. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it's not just about, I think especially these days when it's not just about what's happening at a restaurant and, you know, what the food on the plate is. It's it's truly about what is the chef's vision, you know, yeah. what is the cultural starting point, like what more is there besides delicious food on a plate? Because there's millions of restaurants that serve delicious food on a plate and it's really about you know, the culture, the story yeah. behind the cuisine, what's new, what's different. Um, what are they sharing with the world that's unspoken, unseen? Um, and totally. bring, to be able to bring all those stories out. Totally, man. So how can people book to come to the restaurant? Um, you can just follow us at Khan Restaurant on Instagram, uh, on Resi. How are, you, how are you spelling Khan? Just for anybody. K-A- that- yeah. Good, great question. K A N N. Khan means cane, as in sugar cane and Haitian Creole. Uh, we are on Resi. And yeah, I mean, those are the conrestaurant.com is our website. There's tons of information there. And uh, we release reservations one month at a time on the second of the month prior. Are your menus like live or do they change on a regular? Uh, so we have an opening menu that's online right now and, uh, we'll probably do like a small menu change for the fall because we have lots of berries and watermelon on the menu right now Mm -hmm. and there's going to have to change. Uh, but you know, we're only six weeks old, so we're going to keep most of the menu on for a little bit longer just Mm. so everyone can get to experience our new signature dishes. Nice. Nice, man. Dude, let's call it a day. Um, it's your day off, so I want you to go and enjoy it. So to talk to me <laughs> for this so. song. <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming on. I'm so happy. Oh, man, my pleasure. I'm so happy. What's up with you? Any new new music for us? DJ Will Park? Oh, man, we were supposed to have new music on Friday, just gone, but the Queen decided to die. Um, uh-huh. So we, we, had to, we had to change that because there's okay. technically yeah. no... I'll send you it. I don't think you've actually heard it. I'll send you it. Okay. All right, I'm um, down. But yeah, man, um, thank you so much for coming Thanks, on. It means a lot. I love Always you, dude. A pleasure. Keep safe, and yeah. I'll um, I'll see you very soon, hopefully. See you soon. <laughs> love you, dude. Take it easy. Bye. Bye. And that's a wrap. Huge love to everybody that's listening. Huge love for Gregory to coming on. I love that podcast. Please hit subscribe. Please give us a review, and see you next time. Keep safe.